Hi, this is Private Here Station, and today we bring you day 750 of Russian war with Ukraine. As always, with former advisor to the office of the President of Ukraine, Lieutenant Colonel Alexei Rostovich, and a Ukrainian journalist Nikolai Feldman. This stream is about two hours long, but was very interesting. They deep dive into positive developments on the front this week and uh, three new asymmetric tactics found by Ukrainian military to counter the threats uh, that Russia brings to their territory. Our thanks go to our members. This week we highlight Andriy Patinko and ex Gaidamak. Thank you guys for supporting our work. Um, shout out to you and of course everybody else listening to this podcast. If you can, I would like to support our work. Join us, become a member on the YouTube channel or do a super thanks. Much appreciated. With this, let's go to the stream, uh, the first part of it. It's about uh, 50 plus minutes long. I think you'll find these news coming from the front rather exciting. With this, enjoy. Hello everybody, this is Project Alpha, you're watching War Diary. My name is Nikolai Feldman, Alexei Rostovich is online with me. Good evening, everybody. We have a lot of relatively good news today, right? Yeah, we should. We should announce them. Let's um, change some of our tone and say how good things are. <laughs> well, not all good things, but uh, not thing all things are good, but uh, there are some good, hopeful things. And it's also quite a Rubicon moment, right? Russia has the Putin's uh, re-election so-called campaign and he also gave an interview internally uh, spoke about a lot of things and sent a lot of signals outwardly I think we'll touch on that as well but uh, let's uh, touch the situation on the front okay let's go to the map okay right now there are two opinions in the media sphere uh, one of them says Russians have exhausted and we have paused them. And that opinion was even voiced by President Zelensky. But if you look at what's happening, this is not exactly that. They, We can say strategically that, yes, the uh, President is correct, but it needs a few items to be uh, described in order to be completely true. So they still continue down south. They push from Avdivka to the west, towards Joseph Yar, and over here, near Svatova, there is almost nothing in Svatova, but Belogorovka, that uh, Liman Belogorovka, that is also rather active, and they continue pressure on our troops. A very characteristic to the current situation is that they started to bring into fight tactical and operative reserves and operative tactical level roughly so operative reserves they don't have much mostly they have brigades joint units on the level of brigade and united units that's on army corps levels and that's more tactical reserves oh, sorry more uh, operative reserves so when I'll be saying United Forces, I would mean Army Corps, when I would say Joint Forces, that's a brigade or a detachment level. And tactical reserves, roughly, that would be a brigade. A brigade would have a battalion, some storm battalion maybe. Division may have a detachment. Brigade may have a couple battalions as reserves. They had them before. They were not using them until now, that mean, but now they are uncorking them and sending them over to fight. And now they essentially admit with that action that after Avdiivka, well, right now the front is frozen, most for the most part it's not moving one way or another. And as we talked before, after capturing Avdiivka, they actually did try to stay on the shoulders of our withdrawing troops and continue pushing forward. Let's get to Avdiivka here, right? And I wrote a whole material and we discussed about that, that it was the result of not only experience by General Mordvichov while his taking of Mariupol, but also due to some changes in the organizational structure of Russian army that was drifting in it from the Soviet system 
to a degree they can rethink their experience and aggregate additional resources. Because the stalemate that uh, Zaluzhny indicated on the front in November in The Economist, it can be overcome two ways. The same thing repeated in the First World War. Um, there is an opinion that tanks overcome the stalemate, but uh, there were two. Before tanks, there were Germans who created special storm groups as a tactic, and then later, French and Britain, they did uh, larger operations with tanks and artillery and some aviation elements, what we know now as all army operation. And this was uh, not entirely due to the technical capabilities, although they did improve, but also due to new organizational capacities that they found, new organizational moves that they discovered. And technical was only supporting that strategy. So Russian army, very slowly, as they usually are, and very uh, hands growing out of their butt way, um, as they do, but they're slowly drifting in that direction. Now they have depleted all the existing capacity of their current organizational structure. And we can take Pokrovsk, Dnipropetrovsk, any other attempts where they tried to push and failed. So them bringing tactical reserves into fight shows that they have an ironclad task to achieve certain milestones. They, only they know and their command know what exactly was said to them as a task. I suspect it would mean uh, them reaching some new front outline and creating a more advantageous positions for future offensive. But these perspectives are very iffy right now. And we can seriously suppose that without a large-scale mobilization in Russia and then two to four months or even more that it will take to convert fresh recruits into somewhat adequate uh, military fighting force and groups of uh, the level of division or even army corps, they will not be successful on any of the directions. And that's also an answer to the question whether Ukraine is in a good form to, in a good shape to hold the front. We were not the first ones to say, uh, we did remark on that last time, answering questions, but we did say that uh, shells finally arrived, that initiative about 800,000 shells came through, and Americans uh, finally are sending fresh support, and more is coming from Europe. So we are showing that Ukrainian defense forces, at the bare minimum, can hold the current front. So, roughly speaking, that ideation of uh, Russian command to obtain significant successes in Zaporozhye, Lugansk and Donetsk regions have failed, especially for Putin's uh, so-called re-election attempt. So, you can see how much resources they're trying to throw, the whole armies in some places, and the results, which are maybe occupying of a company position that was held by Ukraine troops before. So the output is very puny to the level of effort. And we can summarize and say that Russia does not have a capability to realize their numerical advantage to capture significant territories on the battlefront. And after Avdivka, they came to a stalemate. So this is a positive news, very positive news because we remember how apocalyptic were the expectations that they might break through, they might capture Lugansk and Donetsk regions, Kramatorsk and then Dnieper will be on the front. People were asking if they have to relocate. No, they're still quite far from being able to do that. And now we have a very interesting phase starting. By the end of summer, they need to aggregate new strategic reserves if they will do mobilization in a more active fashion or find some other way to increase the numbers of their servicemen and the first line of readiness will be june and that's when they can throw quickly unprepared troops after the initial attempt to gather them and just to provide additional pressure on the front but if we will have enough shells at that time and we will have our resources at the current level we should be able to hold the front, and we probably will be doing even counter-offensive actions in some parts of the front. But as for serious effects, if their military complex will be working successfully, and they might be producing some stuff, I want to say, they will have a second milestone at the end of summer, and that fully 
matches the strategic ideation of Putin's command, as I understand it, which matches the election campaign active phase in the United States, when they will have to show some super results at that time. So we have about, what is it, month three, four, we have about four months till the end of August, four to five months to the next uh, arms race, who will be prepared better. And the good news that we saw is that failed, despite their new organizational form and the use of it, they failed to advance. And that's where we need to outline that the race will be not only about technical capabilities, but also in regards to organizational capabilities, and they will continue their evolution there, and as should we, and the exam will be on the battlefield. That's where we'll see how effective it is. I'm a careful optimist here, so I think they will be only partially successful. Uh, far from everything will be successful. They might get some results, but uh, nothing outstanding like break through for five, 50 or more kilometers. Um, they might be successful local in local parts, but generally we should be expecting that their effectivity would rise a little bit. They've been doing that for the last two years and the trend will likely continue. So the next question is what we'll be doing in response. Because all these actual things about rebuilding, reconstruction of our military industrial complex, it did not fade away. It actually is becoming more and more adequate. So out of the positive elements, we actually see that the construction of defense line is active. It's being done rather intensively. And not only due to statements by president and his generals and some of our military journalists who come to the front and show some videos, this is also news from the local parts of the front, where local media is reporting what's going on. So this gives hope to people, and this gives stability to our troops, starting from psychological and moral knowledge that uh, they are being supported, that they are being provided for. And you can criticize a lot of things, but we made a strategic decision, we started implementing it, we cannot actively evaluate it at this point, realistically. it's. Uh, a hodgepodge of different activities on different fronts. So, as it gets built, we will see more progress. I want to say that this is one of those five strategic decisions that were made by Kremlin, but were not made by Ukraine. And by the fact of just starting to move in that direction, we already are going in and creating the right dynamics, because very often in war, it's not uh, so important to destroy a tank or a plane, which is important too, but it's not the paramount. The paramount task is to, of a strategy, especially on a strategic level, is to break the ideation of the enemy, to break the strategic plan of the enemy. And we are breaking it with this activity. So we can be seriously happy about that. This is a great positive news. So we have two. We stopped Russian troops at the current line, and second, we are digging in, we are starting to fortify our positions, right? I still have a rhetoric question, why the heck so late? Why didn't we do it earlier? Um, let's keep it on the rhetorical level to avoid the lengthy discussion about all the directors being corrupt and dumb. Let's just keep it on the higher level. And I will leave it at the level we why didn't we do earlier. Um, second news, I want to talk about the waking of Europe that has a key relation to what's happening on the front. All right, Alexei, I want to clarify one point before we go there. In our streams, you have said numerous times that I'm saying something now, it'll take about two to three months and then other people will see, and other commentators and analysts will see that uh, this is exactly what's going to happen, or this is exactly a decision that needs to be made. What other decisions do you think that need to be stated that are not being done yet, but they're obvious that need to be done? Oh, we have a direct uh, template from five strategic de decisions by uh, Putin's Russia. We, let's go bottom up. First, strategic fortification. Second, change systems in the country in war. And uh, we have some positive things, we'll get to that a bit later. A third item is military industrial complex it needs to be reactivated, and we have more positive news on this. Fourth is intensification of sanctions against Russia. We'll talk about that too. 
uh, sanctions are great, and it's not only about the West slapping them. Our UAVs are actually really good at delivering some of these sanctions about their refineries. And the fifth, something needs to be done about the Global South, because as I wrote today, we have an illusion that the world is supportive of us in Ukraine. Two-thirds of the world are either indifferent or even more, uh, some of them are not exactly supportive. So, and we started to address all these fives to some degree. So I can say that due to efforts of President Andrei Yermak and our diplomacy, we have a formula of peace that uh, aggregates 60 countries, and that's a serious achievement without illusions that come to these meetings. But working with the global south, we need to emphasize a global level of communication with them. And they're in an anti-colonial rhetoric against the West often. They consider us to be a marionette, a puppet doll of the West, and they basically ready to sell us some of the military equipment as long as uh, it is done in a hush-hush manner so Russia doesn't uh, know about it. And do I think that we're working enough with these countries? No. I think we can throw more efforts to build good relations, better relations with the Global South. We are undertaking serious efforts. I know who is doing that, Gargantuan efforts. I want to say Andrei Yermak, he is the main mover on that field. But we also need to reinforce that with government politics, policies, not just personal contacts of Andrei. And we need to keep talking about that to give enough support. And our main problems are military industry and military system. And I still think that we need to use these six months that we have, roughly. We need to adopt certain bills. And our Congress is, for whatever reasons, are very congressmen are very slow. And I wonder if that is probably just an attempt to win some political capital for some of them, but I would treat that as a crime against our nation at this point, because we need to rapidly adopt a bill that would allow troops to get new training, to get better training. They need to be recruited in a proper way, they need to be trained in a proper way, and we need to use them according to their abilities and training. So as for recruitment, we have a positive news. They got a very strict order, those uh, drafting centers in the regions. They got an order to allow the recruit to select a specialty, military specialty and detachment that they go to. As far as I understand, I have not read through all the details of it, but those people who did uh, have a chance to read and comment on that, they actually are confirming that the word prohibited is used in that bill, in that order. Um, so basically, Recruit now has a chance to get military specialty, and he is to be expeditedly, very expeditiously sent to a training in that capacity. And exclusions are possible only in two ways. First, when he doesn't know where to go, then government can do the choice for him, can make the choice. And second, when his rights have been violated, then it needs to be addressed in a proper fashion. So. What it allows is that this order, we talked about that, brigades and detachments, they need a way to bring recruits directly into their uh, organizations, into their groups. And these people exist who wanted to go there. And there are a number of people avoiding going to fight, going to war, because they did not know if they would be sent to the right military detachments where they wanted to serve. So. If this order indeed gives this capability, and we'll uh, investigate it further, we didn't have enough time before the stream, but just an appearance or appearing of that uh, order is a huge move in the right direction. It will definitely increase and make uh, the whole drafting process better, and should address the lack of personnel on the front. And we hope it will be also uh, notable effort to popularize the work in military. And it's not even the possible death on the front that um, discourages people, but uh, inability to make their choice when you're going to serve in the military. So if that is realized in practice, that will significantly increase the morale of the recruits. And by the way, today is the day of the recruit in Ukraine, so we should be congratulating all those who are joining the military. 
And I was always on the side that considered that volunteering is a larger meaning, is a larger concept. It's not just going to the army when you get the writ and you have been summoned, but also when you see that there is a need and who want to fight to the military detachments that were volunteer, entirely volunteer detachments. So I am congratulating all those who fought in those uh, volunteer battalions in 2014, those who are fighting in the volunteer, 100% volunteer detachments right now. And I want to congratulate all those who went to fight, uh, when, even when they got the writ or voluntarily went to the drafting office. Uh, I would say our troops are, for the most part, made of volunteers, those people who volunteered to go, to not evade, to not hide. So I would say it's a national holiday. Even those who did not produce their own initiative to go join the army, but decided not to evade uh, when they were summoned. So I would say the Day of Volunteer is a whole national holiday or a remarkable uh, event for the country. Um, I join your congratulations here. Alexei, I wanted to clarify about the volunteers, a very important moment. We did talk about recruiting, that it needs to play a more important role in creating our military. And I think now this order is a very serious step in this direction, right? Absolutely. That hopefully would allow our troops to recruit directly. Um, another moment, I think in our politics, we do not pay enough attention to those volunteers who even in current days uh, still go into the front to fight for our country. And I'm rather sure when we did not have that we do not have a depletion of volunteers. There are not a day where there are no volunteers coming to our drafting points. Every day there are people coming to them. We can discuss how many, but they do. And I think as a country we should be highlighting that. We should be talking about them, what inspired them to come. Right, Nikolai, as a country we should be understanding that this is an important element of public communication, that the voices of those people who go to fight uh, despite of three and a half million people still hiding from the recruitment. Um, it is very important to show these people, to highlight those who decide to still serve and go. And give them the voice so they would outline that these are the negative elements that I think we can improve, and then these are the positive things, and this is what drives me to go to the front. He doesn't even need to call upon others to follow him, not even needed. A person can just describe their own path why they're making this decision. Plus, it shows to the whole society that it's not so scary. Look, we've been head ramming this uh, topic, not just us, but it was a lot of push to get this order through. And finally, we see it coming. It took a year and a half of the difficult war to get through with this initiative, but we finally got it. So it shows that there is a way to achieve results. And that's, uh, again, an indicator that we should continue with every initiative that we think is worthy. So this is in regards to the first, to gathering people, right? So now we have volunteers. The second stage is training them. With all due respect to the teachers who are training our soldiers, and some of them are fantastically awesome, but very often in the military, in the Soviet Red Army, there was a saying, if you cannot command, go teach. If you cannot teach, go be a military advisor. So this always was a sort of a place of exile, right? Uh, not exactly fresh fish. Uh, and apologies to those people who are serving there, who are working that system and doing their best. But as a system, it had certain weaknesses. And the problem is that very often in those training centers, there are people who are training our recruits without having been on the front themselves. And this is one of the serious drawbacks. We should not be doing that. I would say that the best of our troops, the best of sergeants, the best of officers need to be there, need to be training our new recruits. In the good armies, this is a sign of the highest trust when you are allowed to train new recruits. And those people get proper salaries, they get, they get better remuneration, they also get uh, a higher level of promotion, and uh, it's uh, seriously an advancement, not a punishment. And in the front, the, we should be using the system to bring the best of our commanders 
from the front on the, on the rotation to the training centers. So we have to include training centers as part of rotation. And those who do not have military experience, those who do not have that fantastic experience to share, they can be maybe training in the directions and doing other work that is not exactly related to training of the best or the war fighters. So that's why we need to change that training element. It's not a trivial task due to the simple reason that all of our training centers can be reached from uh, the territory of Russia by a missile. And any aggregation of our troops causes them uh, a nervous desire to send a missile there and kill our recruits in mass. And we had events like that happening before. So this is not a trivial task. But there is a positive element to that, because in order to train an officer or a fighter to act and react in a military fashion, you need to be able to do that in a military fashion even when you're training. So now our training is in kind of a military fashion because it's in a crosshairs of the enemy. Like when I was training, I want to remember a great uh, Lieutenant Kamushnikov, uh, Anatoly Kamushnikov, thank you so much for your training. He was insisting that even during the usual workday, when we were coming to a class, we need to think that we're always in a crosshairs. That's what professional is when you're doing military professionalists, when you're doing everything as if you are being targeted by the enemy. And when you are training in a military center, you also understand that there is a real sense of danger. That's when the professionalism starts in special services and some uh, storm brigades and all, uh, where it's related with specific risk. It's not an additional effort right now that uh, you need to make to Imagine where you can be attacked from. Now, now you actually have a real probability of being hit by the enemy while you're training. So the training is actually expedited and it's done in a military fashion as close to the front as possible. If we address it right, we can get a better trained troops to our front from these centers. Because the motivation is there, it's not a potential fear or threat anymore. It's the real risk and there are real dead and wounded already from these hits. So we can look on that side as a positive. Second step, uh, second element that is uh, great is also preparation of our troops across the border. There are a lot of commentary that NATO fighters don't know the specifics of our front, which is true, but having a prepared soldier or prepared commander or prepared command group or a brigade, even if they are taught something different, if they are systemically trained, it's always better than the group that is not trained. Even if NATO did an emphasis on the different things that what we need on the front, it is much easier to adapt these troops to the front. I want to say that also our opponents in this war, the way they train their troops, um, their cycle training cycle is about three months. Uh, that's why during the first mobilization they called upon 360,000. They separated them in two halves and the first half was thrown to the front immediately. There were cases when People were thrown to the front after being recruited in two days and they either were killed there or were captured in just two days after being recruited. But uh, the other half was spending about three months in the training centers before being sent to the front. So unfortunately for us, we do not have the luxury of spending three months for recruits training. Our terms, our time frame is much more compressed and there likely would be some cases where recruits will be thrown to the front rather rapidly. And then there is another topic that we need to address. We need a division, brigade or detachment schools that will be training recruits on the front, that will be continuing their training there. But for that, we need to address the military structures. We need to have a certain systems. We need to have organizational units of the higher level that will be able to house these training facilities and these capabilities. Because after you implement that, when you increase the level of unity in the troops, you have, uh, as, as resulting factor, uh, increased level of your soldiers who go through training, and also the effectivity of the whole detachment grows better. The esprit de corps grows and appears, has a chance to appear, because then it's not only on the battalion level, but you also have a higher level, an army level of school, and there creates it creates a certain chemistry and a certain use and uh, you know it differs from army to army when uh, different troops within that army they know how to react with each other they know of each other they know their specificity and 
it creates a certain unity between them. They become much more effective top-down, including the officers in the command who have better understanding of the operations they can carry out. And I think this is one of our um, significant drawbacks that we don't have right now. And there are people who are still explaining in Ukraine that we should not have army corps and this is not a NATO system. No, NATO has that level too. It's done differently. Um, and Russia is slowly drifting in that direction. So we, with all our differences and disconnects, we still manage to stay on our feet and make faster decisions than Russians. So when we finally come to making a right strategic decision, we are much faster in implementing it, because they have a negative selection system, centralized with a negative aspect, so they get a lot of negative and not effective officers to implement that, and management is generally uh, <laughs> the various degrees of suck. So we are more effective in this regard. The moment the decision is finally made, we implement that much faster and in much more quality, higher quality level than Russian side does. The, our current problem is that they're making these decisions before us, earlier than us very often. They're just slow at implementing. And responsibility on our side needs to still be on those who are making these decisions. I know, dear sirs and gentlemen, that you are monitoring our streams. So my appeal to you, we need to create army corps and detachments. Sirsky, as a new commander-in-chief, understands that's fine. He got his education with that system. Break through with that initiative. Go to the office. Go talk to the president. Enough of that fiddling at the local smaller levels. We need army corps. Because otherwise, you will not be able to effectively control your troops via the temporary commands, as you're doing now. The command organization that is running the army has to be not a temporary. And okay, I should drop a couple of the nuances. I think I've said enough. I shouldn't be going into details how they're doing actually now. So our next objective, I think, is to make sure that we draft well, we train well, and we use them well. We got positive signals on all of them. First is the recruitment order. We need to go deeper into the details and the weeds of it, but the fact that it was pushed and it was uh, an initiative from above, so it will be effectively rather implemented. That's good. Second, Sirsky declared that our detachments started a more active phase of rotation. They have done that before, uh, but they have been rotating at a very different pace. Um, and it was done by a certain choice of certain commanders. There were brigades who were fighting since the 24th of February without rotation, and there were brigades who rotate by a battalion and getting back to normal and then returning back to the front. So some brigades were doing it regularly, others less so, and now we see the effort to make it a regular event all across the front. So this is a great initiative that allows to produce changes in the way people are used. And this is a partial but very serious success on this front, so a lot of good positive signals this week. And we know we're trying to be objective. When we fuck things up, I will be saying that this is bullshit, I'll be swearing and I'll be stomping my feet and breaking windows. But when they're making positive decisions, I'm up front saying that this decision is positive and uh, it's uh, not an issue for me to come and congratulate them on this. And that's what's happening today. There was also in the news today that Sirsky, on his own initiative, suggested to increase the battle payouts from 100,000 to 200,000. And um, I remember how the decision about 100 was made. It was generally a um, random amount that was picked. Um, it was not uh, well thought out. Indeed, uh, I confirmed that, Nikolai, it was uh, just a pretty number that was named, it was not calculated, and it was just uh, slapped as the remuneration. So now the initiative to increase that twice, uh, it's not calculated one, right, as well? Well, true, but it's a very good decision overall, because any mobilization today is still a hybrid, right? Part of them were uh, sent uh, read to their home and they were insisted upon visiting the recruitment center and then the others came uh, as volunteers. I will not be also naming exact numbers, but we have a significant number of people who are avoiding being drafted because 
two reasons. They likely will not be used according to their ability, so they're not going to fight like that. And uh, second, the remuneration they think is not big enough. And it's not only in our country that these people exist. These are people who are ready to fight. Recently, a foreign legion was celebrating the date of its creation, and we congratulate them. These are people who are ready to fight. There is a large number of professionals among them. And these professionals usually don't like when they're being recruited haphazardly and being used not according to their skills. So if we rectify that issue, we can get a wave two and even wave three of recruits. But I think this will also be supported with better payouts. And Sirsky's suggestion consisted of two halves. One, he said, where will, will we take money? We will fire those who don't want to fight. All those uh, refusers will get rid of them because they deteriorate our fighting capability. So there are two good things in his suggestion. One is to increase the payouts to those who want to fight and to withdraw any payment from those who do not want to fight. Because uh, regardless, uh, they're still, while well, they're still on the balance of military, they're still getting some payments. And, um, you know, the reality is you cannot, inf you cannot force them to fight, literally. Even if you throw them in a trench, it doesn't mean that he'll fight. Yet they're consuming resources, they are demoralizing their uh, companies or detachments. So this is a very good suggestion. And if we realize that at the large scale of our military, this can become a very good sources for our continuous hybrid mobilization. Same in Russia, by the way, there is a partly mobilized, partly contracted, and um, yeah, they already are throwing different groups to the front. So here we have our Rada, our Congress, coming out with initiative to start drafting some of the inmates. And this is another reason, another source for mobilization. There are two positions about that. One of them says, sure, we need all kinds of people. But then there is a different opinion, uh, dissenting one saying that the use of inmates is very limited and you can use them only in the similar conditions that Wagner did uh, on the Russian side, when any violation results in execution of uh, the violator, Ukraine cannot afford such an option for ourselves. And it has more drawbacks bringing criminal relations into war fighting detachments and significantly decreasing the crime situation where the troops are located because you know it's uh, uh, these criminals can start robbing the locals and uh, people in the area where they're deployed so this is a very dangerous solution and maybe it can be implemented but any perhaps under condition that any mistake any mistake you make at the front for an inmate that first of all he gets sent back second his time in jail is to be increased twice if uh, he failed on the front. So maybe that, some sort of uh, structure like this. Because of course there are people too, but there's a certain vibe, certain energy uh, with those who are in prisons right now. Not those who got there by due to their accident, that they hit somebody in their vehicle or uh, involuntary manslaughter charges. Or There are others who are there for serious crimes and I would think in our conditions I would not be touching up on that resource perhaps the only part that we can get from there is our military serviceman who were jailed for whatever reason so if he was a military serviceman who violated something and was sent to prison and we can maybe give them a chance to pay it back on the front otherwise I would not be bringing criminals to the front because on their current ethics, uh, the ethics of the criminal society in Ukraine, they cannot even put the military uniform properly. They have serious uh, issues with their philosophy and their motivation. In military, everything has to be rather black and white in this regard. It's time to attack, let's go and fight the enemy. It's not about, you know, who's right, who's uh, higher, who is uh, prevailing. So it's a very difficult topic to approach. Firstly, I would concentrate on removing the refusers from the front and bring them back to civilian society and they would bring more worth to the front even if we use them at the factories maybe produce shells or bullets or even if they're sitting at home they're not deteriorating our fighting capabilities and second we need to make sure that the other people would be coming to replace those refusers and material remuneration is uh, not the only way to motivate them but definitely not the last one okay we also had news from this week that russians starting to use one and a half ton 
air bombs on our positions. How critical are, is that? Yes, it is news. Well, first of all, they keep increasing the accuracy. And when you see pictures of these munitions, you can see a lot of antennas on their new generation of bombs, the one that uh, actually has some targeting capability. So they're using a lot of antennas to allow some way to communicate with the, the bomb in flight, so it would not be blocked by our means. And also, what is a one and a half ton bomb? When a 500 kilogram bomb explodes, it guarantees concussion for everybody within a hundred yards. When it's one and a half tons, that's about 250 yards of concussions around it, especially if you fail to hide in a trench or somewhere. And roughly after the use of one and a half ton bomb, about a half kilometer of the front is uh, really feeling bad if they're not dead. And it can be rather effective in the cities as well, even in the field too. It's a serious game-changing weapon. It is an important factor in the battlefield that we need to do something about. First, we need to reinforce our air defense systems. That's why our Patriot systems moved closer to the front. And that's why two of them were destroyed by three Iskander missiles. Yuri Butusov uh, had details about how it happened, including the death of the personnel. This week we had two serious issues, Patriots being destroyed and then helicopters were destroyed that decided to refuel at about 40 miles away from the front on the open uh, field and they, there is a video as how they were destroyed. So it's not only us who have successes, enemy has successes too. And second, take aviation somewhere, get it, uh, those F-16s or something that would allow to use air-to-air -air missiles to push away Russian aviations further away from the front that uh, can launch now these uh, heavy aerial bombs from 70 or 80 kilometers away from the front, or 40, 50 at least. And this is the range limit of air defense systems for many of the systems we have. And uh, our air defense uh, actually are stationary targets so they can get hit. Aviation is a more flexible and more effective tool to fight that threat and that's where we're waiting for f-16s i think six were promised to the beginning of the summer 12 overall during the end of summer uh by the end of summer and then probably a few dozen further down the year um, even if we get a dozen of them that will alleviate a lot of stress for our troops on the front so as you see the west is awakening just very slowly so for now it is a factor a serious factor yeah, I'm reading the news here that Ukraine will be able to deploy F-16s in July. And yeah, that's the one I'm talking about. The training and delivery turned out to be more lengthy and complicated. And Ukraine can start only with six out of 45 announced. Right, Nikolai, but even six on that direction, say of Devka direction, would be effective as a factor. And they would have played a significant role in the fall of Avdivka and the fight for Avdivka. And uh, we do have an answer. France, according to the open source publications, they uh, sent us about 600 guided bombs. We saw their use in different telegram channels that uh, trace this war. This weapon is more precise than what Russians have. And our aviation is using them rather successfully. To the owner of our and French specialists that outfitted our aviation to be able to use these uh, unique bombs. And there were a lot of conversations about a year and a half ago that Russian avionics, the old style uh, MiG jet systems will not be allow to use these weapons, but we are apparently rather talented and we figured how to use even storm shadows with them. So we're rather resourceful in this regard. And again, they have delivered not only those 600 but they also promised 50 every month, according to Macron's promise. This is not uh, as much as Russians are using. I think last month they used 1,250 Russian bombs, but even a hundred of our bombs used is another opportunity to provide certain parity on some direction and uh, make the life of our troops better and the life of their troops on the front harder. One should understand that war is like a symphony. Individual decisions, they do not change the whole war. They usually uh, participate in a big orchestra, in a big symphony of action. So it has to be synchronized. The better you orchestrate things together, if we say we add fortifications, add air defense systems, bring our aviations, bring 
more flexible use of our means and measures, we perhaps do not have aviation to cover the whole front and uh, not that many air defense systems, but if we bring them to the key areas of Russian activity, it can create a certain situation where it will make much harder for Russian opponents to find solutions to these problems, despite of the organizational changes and other measures they take. In this regard, Budanov was not too wrong when he said that in spring, the phase will change in our favor, in the phase of this war. Not sure about the overall change, but for now, definitely they're aggregating operative strategic reserves, and that likely will cause a certain favor for us on the front, at least until the beginning or the middle of summer. They can still aggregate enough people with their mobilization and just throw them to the front without preparations, and that might have a short-term effect. But it is important for us to have a certain amount of measures and means that we can maneuver. We cannot be equally strong as our uh, attackers, but we can concentrate our excess uh, measures, uh, means, and uh, one or two important directions to stop them there. And we have two more things that Russian Federation cannot counter, and these are two most important strategic decisions. First is uh, naval drones that are successful in destroying Russian Black Sea Fleet, and second, one of the most important strategic decisions is to concentrate our efforts on destruction of oil industry in Russia. I want to say that on the 12th of May 1941, before Germany attacked Soviet Union, the General of Air Force of the United States, General Spartz, suggested to concentrate the efforts of strategic aviation on the German factories of synthetic fuel for military equipment. This was considered to be one of the most important strategic decisions of this war. Alike, our decision to attack Russian oil industry is just as valuable. According to different data, 10 to 12 percent of Russian oil industry was destroyed last week. It was serious, good attacks on the very vulnerable technological elements of their refineries, and they are out of commission for a long period of time now. And we hit three factories like this uh, last week. If we continue that, we will cause them much harm, and uh, Russia is already forced to make rash decisions about limiting the exports of oil products, because one thing to fuel their uh, vehicle, another is to fuel their aviation. And uh, our naval drones that uh, have sunk about a quarter of Russian Black Sea Fleet and continue to push them out, this is another great success. And we have direct successes in these areas that Russian Federation doesn't know how to counter, because creating and building of new oil refineries in the north where we cannot reach them, is a very costly and lengthy proposition. They cannot build it in a month, and the Russian strategy only lasts till about the elections of the next president of the United States, and maybe slightly beyond it. And uh, then the implementation of those oil refineries will not likely happen until about 20, end of 25 or 26. So this is a sig significant factor that enables us to be more active and to get more results and to call a lot of Russian capabilities. Let me clarify here about the oil refineries. Do you think that the numbers of 10 or 15 percent of oil industry are a bit too optimistic, given that the technological structure of each oil refinery is rather complex and it's not so easy to get it out of commission entirely? Yes, it is a difficult story. It is a difficult activity, but even if we shrink these optimistic numbers by three times, even 3% in one week, this is a significant success. But I'm looking at the data at, by independent experts, not only Russian or Ukrainian, we understand that the country that is being hit will be diminishing the level of damage and the country that is hitting them will be increasing their success, but we can take independent ones and we get, imagine we destroyed five or three percent. This is a serious factor, right, in a week, exactly. If that continues, and they do not have anything to counter this with, they do not have enough air defense systems to provide cover for their troops on the front, and also the border of Russia, where the UAVs fly through, and of course they cannot protect every individual factory. And most of their oil refineries are in the European part of Russia, where we can reach them rather effectively. And this is a very, very serious factor. And there is a third thing, a very good example of asymmetric uh, war action, the attacks by Legion of Russia and uh, Russian Volunteer Corps who are fighting in a different area 
than uh, Russians were expecting them. They were expected in Belgorod region, and they entered into the Kursk region, and there are a lot of fighting happening there. They and some reporters are saying that uh, they were used tactical paratroopers in the area, but it's not so important what is being used. The fact that on the eve of elections or during the elections, so-called elections in Russia, Putin cannot provide for security of its territory. And it's not Ukrainians fighting on their territory, it's Russians against his regime fighting actively on the territories near the border of Russia. And this is a significant factor that drops the image of Putin and his regime that supposedly is doing successful special operation because you cannot consider it political success when suddenly the war jumps back onto your territory. I'm not even talking about military successes, but I'm staying on the political level. This is a serious factor that devaluates the effort of Russian propaganda, both internally and uh, out in the bigger world, because Putin now cannot be talking to Chinese and other leaders of the South, saying how successful he is when he's actually engaged in uh, fighting on his own territory with Russians armed and fighting against his regime. And of course, raid operations uh, against the much larger forces of enemy are never easy, but these measures can be different and they highlight that we can do different and unique asymmetric measures to fight and counter Russian aggression. Just on this week we found three, right? Naval drones being effective in destroying Black Sea Fleet, destruction of oil refineries and uh, actions of Russian Volunteer Corps, uh, Siberia Group and uh, Freedom of Russia Legion. So it shows that we are capable of continuing the pressure on both political levels and military levels. And we have a lot of scope in front of us. We are creative. We can actually conduct a rather successful warfare, especially supported by the West. And we do have more good news uh, coming from Europe. I'm ready to discuss news from Europe unless you want me to address the front more. Okay, yeah, let's talk about Europe and that will be continued in part two. Thank you so much. Do not forget to click like and subscribe. We appreciate your time.